the Ouija board, and that's Ouija board, not Ouija board, with all due respect to Joe Bob Briggs, has been a constant source of fascination since its inception in 1890. Hi, I'm Kip Parker. And I'm Charlie Parker. And we're the, the Parker, Parker Brothers. Brothers. That's why we got this brand new game called Ouija. Well, Ouija, Kip, tell me about it. Well, inside the package comes a flat board with all the letters of the alphabet, numbers from zero to nine, and a yes-no written out by itself. It also comes with this planned jet which hovers over the letters the dead are trying to tell you. Ghostly movements and other supernatural appearances went further back than that, and there were crude inceptions before 1890, but that's when the board as we know it came about. It was commercialized sometime later, and of course, it showed up as a device in horror movies ever since. The Witch Board series that started in 1986 is probably the most popular series that features the spirit communicator, but another, more straightforward series called Ouija is also out there. While the first one that came out in 2014 is a bit of a dud in every sense of the word, the sequel is truly something special. Brought to us by Mike Flanagan in a preview on what was to come, Ouija 2 Origin of Evil deserves better than to be ignored and thought of as just a sequel, or prequel, to a middling mid-2010s horror. The first movie came out courtesy of the three-headed monster of Blumhouse, Platinum Dunes, and Universal Studios. Platinum Dunes was one of those horror studios that specialized in the genre like Lionsgate and later Blumhouse, and Universal is the progenitor to modern horror as we know it. It was written by Julie Snowden and Styles White, and the directing duties falling to White. They were a team who also co-wrote things like the 2003 Boogeyman, Nick Cage Vehicle Knowing, and The Possession. They also co-wrote Ouija and To Date, this is White's only directing gig. It stars Olivia Cook before she became a megastar, and a few other actors that don't really jump out, except Lynn Shea because a certain number of horror movies released each year are contractually obligated to have her in them. Those are the rules. It follows a group of people who mess with a Ouija board and strange things start to happen involving ghosts, possession, and murder. It's about as milquetoast as you can get, while audience and critical scores weren't stellar, the damn thing made $104 million on its $8 million budget. You know what that means. Two years later, those same studios, in conjunction with Hasbro, would release a prequel to Ouija titled Ouija Origin of Evil. This time around, it would be written and directed by a little-known creator named Mike Flanagan. 2016 was a big year for Flanagan, and it's the year he really started to build his brand. In addition to the prequel that is today's subject, he also released the home invasion thriller with a unique twist hush, and the non-horror, but it gets lumped into the horror category before I wake. Before those, he had the Karen Gillan-led mirror horror Oculus, and his indie darling Absentia. If you haven't seen Absentia, go watch it. It's a huge reason he was noticed and handed the reins to the next four movies, which steamrolled into his current success. Flanagan writes, and edits for that matter, most of his stuff, but also had a co-writer on Ouija in the form of Jeff Howard. To be fair, Howard had also helped co-write Oculus and Before Our Wake, and would go on to help write Gerald's game and episodes of both Haunting of Hill House and Midnight Mass. More recently, he helped write and executive produce the short-lived live-action Resident Evil TV series for Netflix. The movie has a great cast, too, with future Flanagan regulars Elizabeth Razor, Henry Thomas, Lulu Wilson, and his wife and frequent collaborator Kate Siegel. No, not that one. It also stars Annalise Baso and has appearances from Doug Jones and Lynn Shea. Again, following the rules of horror movies. The movie opens with telling us that we are in Los Angeles in the late 60s. The setup isn't reinventing the wheel by any means. A widow and her two daughters struggle to pay the bills and set up a medium service to help grieving clients get closure from the dead. I'm so sorry. It's... The spirit world is unpredictable. It's a scam, of course, but these people don't seem bad. She deserved it, Mom. She was just trying to steal her dad's money. That isn't what we do here. It's our job to comfort them, not judge them. You have the mom doing whatever it takes to provide for her kids, the younger, more innocent daughter that doesn't fully understand what they are doing, and the older, jaded daughter who's a bit rebellious. Elizabeth Reeser plays the mom, and she's great, just like she's great in Haunting of Hill House. Outside of the Flanagan film's repertoire, she has a big part in the Twilight universe, Nightmare Cinema, and was a featured player on shows like Saved, Grey's Anatomy, and The Good Wife. The younger daughter is played by Lulu Wilson, who is no stranger to horror. In addition to showing up in Hill House and the upcoming Flanagan project The Fall of the House of Usher, see a running theme here? She was in Deliver Us from Evil, Annabelle Creation, and Becky. 
Finally, the older daughter is played by Annalise Beso. Beso has already showed up in Oculus as the younger version of Gillian's character, and was also in the Snowpiercer TV show. Mom Alice is trying to figure out the bills while youngest Doris prays before bed. Lena sneaks out to drink with her other underage friends, and they mess with a Ouija board before getting caught and sent home. As friends we gather, hearts are true. Spirits near, we call to you. There's no spirit. <laughs> Ellie! <laughs> the next day, a boy comes to pick up Lena, and Alice messes with them in hilarious fashion. Have you ever had your palm read? Can't say I have, Mrs. Xander. It's totally painless. Ah. If this hand, or any other hand for that matter, touches my daughter in a way I don't like, you dig? Yes, ma'am. All of this just flows great with that sharp Flanagan writing we've come to expect. If you watch this movie before his other work, you may not pick up on all of his trademarks, but if you see this after his other work, it feels like a lost film of his. Alice picks up a Ouija board from the store to add to their service, and we're introduced to Father Tom, who is a good dude and trying to look out for the family. You know why people say mean things, right? Why? Because they're scared. He's played by Henry Thomas, who is of course in eight total Flanagan projects. To other generation of viewers, he will always be Elliot from E.T., or even Davy from Cloak and Dagger. He doesn't have the longest resume, but he's in some really great stuff throughout his career. Father Tom's wife passed away, and Doris wants the family to get to know him better. The family starts messing with the board, and weird things start happening around the house, including Doris getting a new friend that even helps her with her homework. Is she falling behind? I can help her more. It's nothing like that. In fact, unless she's learned cursive, then somebody's been helping her quite a bit. Alice and Lena worry that Doris doesn't understand what happened to their dad, but then she brings out a ton of money she was told was inside the basement walls. While they think they're being contacted by their late husband and father, something fully possesses Doris and she ends up writing a bunch of pages in Polish, which she absolutely doesn't know. The possession scene is where the movie goes full in on the buy-in. It's one of the best examples of how effective a PG-13 movie can be, and it uses every bit of that rating. The movie takes an unexpected turn here, and we find out that an evil doctor was torturing and experimenting on prisoners in the basement of that house, and when Doris looks through the eye hole of the Ouija board controller, she sees a horrible creature all in black with piercing yellow eyes. He tilts her head back and takes complete control of her. She messes with the kids at school who try to hurt her, completely changes her demeanor around people, and eventually kills the boy that her older sister has seen. Father Tom and Alice go on a date, and later, Tom comes over to the house to help out any way he can, and just see how Doris is behaving. He figures out that Doris is just reading his mind during a session to get his buy-in. He sits down with Alice and Lena to explain what was going on, and breaks down how the trickery happened. He doesn't think she's a fraud, though. He's actually more afraid that she's channeling something truly dangerous. Tom comes back to the family later and explains that all the writing that Doris had done was really by a Polish soldier named Marcus, who describes his death and the death of other people in gruesome ways. The spirits have been watching them the entire time, even now, and they are angry. Tom has requested and been given an approval for an exorcism, but it's too late. They're all stuck inside the house with whatever is stuck inside Doris. They head down to the basement to confront Doris, but she's there and ready for him. The lights go out, and when they strike a match, they find all the bones of the victim buried in the wall. They burn the board, but hear Doris calling for help through a vent. Father Tom goes in to investigate, and comes out into a room none of them knew existed. It's the old torture room, and it still has all of the tools of pain. Doris, possessed by more than one evil spirit now, rushes at Tom and takes him over too. He crawls out of the vent and goes after Alice and Lena, but is able to break the spell just in time for them to escape. Of course, this gives Doris time to push him down the stairs to his death via a broken neck. The movie has another great special effects scene where all the darkened spirits are controlling Lena in an attempt to stop her from helping out her sister. Unfortunately, this kills Doris, but she's safe and reunited with her dad. Lena is now possessed and kills her mother when she is already reeling from killing her younger sister. <laughs> She ends up in a mental hospital, and the film ends with her creating her own Ouija board on the floor using her own blood and a lens from glasses. 
In a post-credits time jump, an older Lena is visited by her niece, and we get the tie into the previous, far more inferior film. Ouija Origin of Evil is not only an underrated film, but one of the best ways to make a sequel, a prequel in this case, of a forgettable film. It qualifies as a best horror movie you never saw, but it's really a black sheep. It's a black sheep of Flanagan's filmography, a black sheep of the possession genre, the black sheep of the Ouija movies, and a black sheep of all those mid-2010 horror movies that just kind of run together. It's available on Netflix, and has been for some time, but even there it gets lost in the weeds of all the other movies that the streaming service would rather push. Take the time to check it out. It delivers on the scares, acting, setting, themes, and it isn't afraid to get a little mean with its characters. You absolutely don't need a Ouija board to decide on watching this little gem.